Amen. Praise God. God bless you. The Lord just changed my message. I love when he does that because then he's in charge. I was between two messages and uh, he just confirmed what he want, wanted me to share. Amen. I'm going to read from Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Here, um, the Lord is speaking to the churches. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, Right. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand. And he walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds. I know your hard work. And I know your perseverance. And he's speaking to the church in Ephesus right here. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men. That you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not. And have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet, verse four says, I have this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Sounds like the perfect church, right? But the Lord says that they have forsaken their first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nic Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So here we see the seven golden lampstands that represent seven churches. And we can read all about the seven churches, but today we're gonna we're gonna read or just concentrate on the church. The Ephesus was pretty, they were a pretty perfect church. And they had a lot of works. They did all the right things. But it says here, but you have forsaken your first love. So we're gonna concentrate on that verse for a little bit. Well, what, what did the Lord mean? I mean, what did he mean when he said to the church in Ephesus, you have forsaken 
your first love. He, he, he doesn't seem to say here, I mean, my observation is that he doesn't seem to be saying that this church didn't love him. It seems, in my understanding, my observation is that this church still loved him. Still loved him. But he's talking about their first love. And how do we, how do we try to understand what God means when he says your first love? Because you see, they voluntarily, right? They voluntarily, they, they, they left their first love, right? They just left their first love. They just left it, right? Like a husband and wife, right? In the beginning, they're very much in love. And there could be so many different things that is wrong in each and every one of their lives. But because they're so much in love, they don't really notice it, right? I don't know how many here have been in love like that before, right? Where you want to talk to the other person day and night, 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 night and day, night and day. You just want to be with the person you love. And some of the young kids look at me like, I'm clueless. I, I, they got that look like, no, I don't know what you mean. Not yet. But one day you will. You have forsaken your first love. Because the Lord, he takes the church and he, he, he gives us that analogy, right? Of that he is the groom and we are the bride, right? So my understanding that in the beginning, right? The bride, all she wants to do is be with the groom. And she is so in love that she's willing to do anything that he asked of her. Anything. Anything that the groom asked of her. In the middle of the night. It's cold outside. It's snowing. There's a snowstorm. You know what? Can you get, get up and make me a cup of hot chocolate? And she'll get up. The bride will get up. And she'll, she'll, she'll make the groom that, that hot chocolate. She'll be like tiptoeing through the tulips all the way to the kitchen and singing and just, you know, with all of her, 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 her heart and with all of her might and with all of her understanding and her love is overflowing and she's just singing and she's preparing the hot chocolate and, and let me put a little bit of cinnamon because cinnamon always makes it taste better. Let me put some marshmallows. I'm going to do it just the way he likes it. Because she, she wants him to know that he is everything for her. He is very special. And that she's, there's nothing that she won't do for him. But then the first child comes along. And he gets a little bit head good. In the middle of the night, he asks her again. The kid is crying in the crib in the other room. And he says, hey, can you fix me a cup of hot chocolate? Okay, well, let me take care of this kid first. He's screaming, he's crying. Well, let me, let me see.
and she does it. But not like the first time. And then the second kid comes along. Now there are two kids that are crying in the middle of the night. Hey, can you fix me a cup of hot chocolate? Because it seemed that he would wake her up at the same time every day because he, he was thinking of that that was their time, right? That was their special time. And she, she drags herself to the kitchen and she's tired. But she fixes up the chocolate. But by the third kid, you know what? You need to get up yourself and go make your own chocolate because I'm tired. And that's kind of what's happening here. Sometimes we, through the years of serving the Lord, I've been serving the Lord 42 years, and a lot of you have been serving the Lord most of your life. And through the years, we, 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 we go through the motions, right? We, we, we do all the right things. We go to church. We, we take care of our family. And we serve one another. And, uh, you know, and, and, and you're here. And then, you know, you look at each other. And then, and then afterwards, you're kind of like just tolerating each other. You're just kind of like just going through the motions of life. And who wants to live like that? <coughs> there has to be a connection. There has to be a relationship. Because the God that we serve He's going to only settle for everything and nothing less. He wants, he wants all of you. He wants all of your love. He wants all of your mind, all of your heart. He wants all of you. All of you. He doesn't want to share you with anyone. You ever have a jealous husband? My husband was very jealous. He was a jealous man. If I looked over a nice looking guy over there in the corner, oh, I was going to hear about it when I got home. <laughs> I said, I learned my lesson real quick. Look straight ahead. Look straight ahead. None of you probably had that problem. <laughs> but my husband, he was very jealous. And God is very jealous for us. He is so jealous that if there's anyone in your heart that's occupying that place of importance, whether it's, it's your child, right? Whether it's your husband, your wife, if someone else is occupying that place in our heart that only belongs to him, he becomes very jealous. At least that's been my experience. The God that I serve, he's jealous over me. And he doesn't want anything or anyone to occupy that space that should only be occupied by him. He has to be first. He will not share his place with anyone else. God is first and everything else, second, third, fourth. Amen? Amen? And I think that the problem, 
I mean, my observation is that the problem that we have in our families so many times is that other things or other people are occupying that space that only God is supposed to occupy. One of the things when, when, when my husband and I, when we came to the Lord, that was the first revelation we received, God first. From now on, God first, you're second. And we used to, you know, the things used to come up and we used to tell each other that I have to serve God first. Sorry, I know what you, you need this or whatever, but God comes first. We used to tell each other that all the time. And I didn't care. I mean, I, I used to tell him, I love God more than you. He goes, yeah, I know. And I love God more than you. Okay, then we're square, we're good. And when you do that, God honors. God honors when you surrender your life like that. He honors that. You know, he's going to he's going to back up everything in his word as long as you put him first in his life. Amen. Let's go to um To Mark. Chapter 1. Here in verse 14. It says, After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, who was Peter, and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake because they were fishermen. In verse 17, it says, Come. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. At once, immediately, they left their nets, and they followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them. And they left their father in the boat with the hired men and they followed him. See, because when God calls you to follow him, to serve him, there's nothing to think about. You just drop everything and you follow him. In John 12, 26, it says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. In John 8, 12, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. Wow, that's a, that's a tough one. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In Matthew 16, 24, it says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loves his life for my sake, loses his life for my sake, will find it. 
John 14, 6 says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 1 Peter 2, verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you may follow in his steps. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering, un sacrificio, the amor, a fra fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. To love God the way he wants us to love him, the only way that we can do it is to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice because like Sister Monica shared when she opened up in prayer, it's a death. To be able to love God and honor Him and serve Him, we have to die to ourselves. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of the Father, who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? That's like, like the church in Ephesus, right? They had a lot of works. And do many mighty works in your name. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That's pretty rough. Matthew 10, 22. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who overcomes, the one who endures until the end will be saved. Mark 1, 16 says, Passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, and he was casting in his net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Because when he calls us to follow him, what he wants us to do is to multiply. He doesn't want us to become to stay sterile. He wants us to multiply. He calls us to multiply. To share the gospel, right? That's what we've been talking about from the very beginning. To share the gospel. And to win souls for the kingdom. So remember, if you left your first love and you're doing all the right things and you're doing all the works and everything, but you left your first love, examine your heart today. And the next time he wakes you up in the middle of the night because he wants quality time with you, To say, Lord, I will gladly serve you. I will gladly serve you. Let us stand. I will ask uh, Pastor Margarito to close the meeting.
know the illustration that Dr. Margaret shared about the husband or the wife that is catering to the husband. It speaks volumes of a two very powerful principles that we are to know more than any other thing in scripture, and that is grace and mercy. Okay. That woman, that bride, was all about grace at the beginning. She poured into her husband. And so the same thing happens with us in our walk, with our, in our spiritual walk. It's all about grace. We live in the dispensation of grace. What that means to us is that right now, it's not about our works. It's about the grace of God, the merited favor of God. He gives us that. But the problem that we have as Christians is that we know that. We know that it's all about grace. But we do our own thing and we say, Lord, just give me some mercy now. Because we know that we should have been punished for the things that we've done for our rebellion and our relationships and our sinful nature. And we just say, well, we just want the cop out. We just want mercy, right? Isn't that how we are? But you see, we can't live a life that way. We have to live a life seeking the grace of God every day of our life. It's all about grace. And when we get that right, we won't need to depend on the mercy of God. Remember, God told Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. So don't think that the mercy of God is going to be there for you one day. Because sometimes God will say, you're going to go through this. You, you made your bed, you're going to lay in this one. But I'll be there in the back end. But now you're going to go through the pain and suffering. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to go through any more pain and suffering. Lord, give me your grace. And for me to be in the grace of God is that I have to seek Him. I have to be one with Him. I have to pray regularly with Him. I have to honor Him by treating my wife, my children, the church, my brothers and sisters, my family and friends with the same love that He's given me. And so today, it's about grace. It's a great word for all of us. We saw the grace of God when we fell in love with the Lord. That first love should be a part of us every day of our lives. Don't let the world define who we are today. Don't let the things that are going on around us change who we are. We're going to go through some stuff. And remember, hold the word of God true to your heart. God didn't promise you a rose garden. He didn't. God told you that you're going to have trials and tribulations. But just know that when you're going through this stuff, it's because He loves you so much that He wants you to go to a new level in your walk with Him. And though it's painful for a moment, James says that it's only for a moment. Hang in there. He's going to carry you out on the back end. So those of us who are going through something right now, we're all going through something. The devil knows that when he's going to pour a blessing and when God's going to pour a blessing in my life, the devil has to come and he's got to rule things. And he almost ruined my retreat this weekend. But as I told my son in the drive off, I said, the devil's not going to have a victory on me. I'm going to go to receive and I'm going to be blessed of God. And so today, if you're going through something, if you came to church this morning and there was an argument in the car, know that the devil doesn't like that you're coming to church today. The devil doesn't like you're about to receive a powerful word from him, from God, the creator, the one who's going to give you the only hope that you need to make it every day of your life. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the great love that you have for all of us, oh Lord. Who are we, Lord, that you are so mindful of us? That you, oh Lord, would send forth, Pastor Margaret, to send this profound divine word at just the right time in our life, Lord. I don't know who needed to hear this message. I know I did. And I'm, I, my hope is that everyone who heard the message today can resonate that that was me. She's speaking to me. The Lord is speaking to me. And so, Lord, forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord, because I have lost my love for you. And, Lord, I want to restore my love for you. Because I don't want to look at my husband, my wife, my children, my job, anything that you've given me. None of that matters, Lord. It's all about you, Lord. I want to seek you with all my mind, heart, and soul. Because if I get that right, Lord, nothing in my life will ever matter. So I thank you, Father, for the word that you've given us, O oh Lord. 
And I pray, Father, that today would be a day of new beginnings for all of us, O oh Lord, to reconcile where we've gone astray. Lord, restore the first love that we've had, Lord, and bring us back to a place, O oh Lord, where intimacy with you is the most important part of our lives. So we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.